Hello, my name is Joel Ivany. I'm an opera stage director and an administrator and a creator, and you're listening to Talking Blues. So, is, is your life as crazy as it was when I last saw you? Uh, maybe a little bit crazier. <laughs> It is, um, yeah, it's busy. It's a busy, you know, I think we all craved to to be busy and to feel like we are doing uh, after what we went through during the crazy years of the pandemic. Um, but like a rubber band snapping back, it feels like it's just busier. Life is busier alongside work and sort of fun stuff. Just everything feels like I want to double... I want to command C and then command V, the amount of time I have in the day and sort of my capacity as well. Is it something that's out of your control? Because, okay, what, what surprised me when we were working together, um, I guess last summer, early fall, there was a point where we were doing the premiere of the video, but you had a premiere like a week before with the Canadian Opera Company. Yeah. And then... The video came out, and then you had another premiere, I believe, in Edmonton. Yeah. And these are like three things happening within a matter of... A couple of weeks. One week? Yeah, one week. Two maybe. weeks, yeah. <laughs> so is that is it crazy because you have this desire to just work, work, work? Or is it crazy because things just happen and you can't schedule things differently? I think naturally things get scheduled when they feel like naturally they need to happen. And so some things like, and it took a bit of rescheduling over the pandemic, but that Carmen at the COC was something that had to happen at a certain time with the theater, the orchestra, all these moving pieces. Um, I think naturally I'm drawn to first say yes, and then kind of sort out schedule in life <laughs> after that. I'm learning more to say no, but um yeah, you want to you wanna do exciting things. And if it fits in the schedule, because like one schedule, I don't know, my brain works this way where now I'm so dependent on my phone and the calendar function. So it's like if the slot is open, well, let's book something in because what am I going to do otherwise kind of thing. So <laughs> I'm drawn to work that way and just, you know, my work is my life. And thankfully, my Life also has these beautiful other things. I have two young sons, so two boys. I've got a wife who is incredibly busy herself. And so um, because I naturally run into them during the course of a day, whether it's them home from school or if I have to pick them up from daycare, like I have to, in a really good way, make time for them as well. But then um, if they're busy at school or daycare, then I can kind of fill in that other time with, yeah, with other work. But, but it, I mean, just, I mean, family life is important and very busy. It takes up a lot of your time. But just based on the fact that you run the Against the Grain Theater Company yeah. and, and running it and administrating it means that you're not just working on one project at a time. Yeah. You're working on a whole season, if not more. And then you're also working with the Edmonton Opera, Opera Company. And then Banff. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and probably more things. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that's crazy. <laughs> it is a bit. I would probably say I'm doing too much. And part of that is opportunities over the last 10 years have led me to this point in terms of independent of all those things you just mentioned. Yeah, I'm, I'm still desiring and wanting to direct operas as an independent kind of self-employed person. So in the spring, like April, May of 23, I'm directing Verdi's Otello at LA Opera, which is unrelated to all those. And I'm like, that's what I really want to do. So I'm not going to say no to that. But then the kind of more full-time-ish gigs of Against the Grain at Edmonton and Banff, we all have to, <laughs> I have to work around that to make sort of the other thing work. And if something doesn't, then that's where um, it takes, um, just certain things of either delegation, which is an important sort of leadership one in terms of I can't do everything. And so what can I pass off and sort of help guide as well? So that other people are learning new skills and sort of taking advantage of 
the opportunity that I have, if that makes sense as well. Okay, so is it, is that a case where somebody came to you and, in LA and said, we have this opportunity, we want you to direct this? Exactly, yeah. Okay, yeah. okay. so I mean, obviously, you're good at what you do, and, and therefore, <laughs> there's a demand. Um, do you, are you able to say no? Um, I didn't say no to that one. <laughs> Partly because it's it would be very cool to hang out in LA for six weeks, but um, now I am started starting to say no to certain gigs that five years ago I wouldn't have said no to, just partly because of I don't know as a self employed artist you kind of have to say yes to everything, but then when certain opportunities that I was able to create like against the Green Theater they turned into semi-permanent part-time work if that makes sense so it's not yeah. a full-time job it's it feels like full-time hours but i'm not paid for full-time so all of a sudden financially i have a more flexibility that i don't have to take on work that maybe won't artistically satisfy me which in the past i used to do just to pay the bills so to speak okay so i, yeah. I want to get into that a little more especially about against the grain but let's go back to the beginning Tell me yeah. about your love of music. When did you first connect with music? Well, we I have three siblings, an older sister and two younger siblings and younger sister and younger brother. And my parents worked for the Salvation Army. They were pastors. So they moved around every three, four, five years. Um, and inevitably, just be, due to that nature, you do make friends at all those places, but your life is a bit transient. Um, so we, we were a tight family. Yeah, we stuck together like glue and my mom was very creative. And so at all these little churches, she would kind of put us on display like a very, like a half size Van Trapp family from the sound of music. And we would, she would give us scripts and rehearse us. And like, we would do, we'd play the piano, we'd sing as a foursome, we'd put on little plays for, for the church. And inevitably in that church environment we would sing in the junior choir and then the senior choir and the Salvation Army has a lot of brass band music so we would play instruments and um, naturally that just was part of what our life was in some ways I didn't really know any different um, so music was always there it was just a very different type of music because it had its own unique uh, <laughs> niche niche set of sounds and history around that well that's it's fascinating that your mom would put on these shows i mean yeah. and now you're putting on shows yeah, I, know. <laughs> I mean do you I think know. that do you think it's connected or do you think it's not that's a good question i've thought of that i'm like do i owe this she would probably want me to say that it's connected to her and part of that is like i always when you become a teenager you kind of rebel and you want to do your own thing and I always like desired to be a performer and be on Broadway or be something where you're you're wanting to be really good at something and to kind of expose your art expose who you are so there was that desire but I was always involved in 12 million different things in high school whether it was playing in the jazz band and the concert band and on the rugby team and on the basketball team so it was like I just never had enough desire or time to focus just on one thing um so i think that's part of it. it it was it was wanting to do this but then um also doing 12 other things at the same time how do you think because i kind of grew up moving around a lot maybe not as much as yeah. you but for the first 15 no, i know so for 13 years of my life we moved a lot of times how do you think yeah. that affected you I was lucky that a lot of them timed out well, like I moved after kindergarten. So I started like grade one in a new school or started grade six in a new school, like junior high. Um, not so much for my siblings, so it was a little bit tougher, but I think what it taught me was that, you know, you hold on to the few, not the few things like, but just what do you take from one place to the next? And it's kind of, even as an adult, it's like, do we keep everything or like spring cleaning that metaphor of like, let's get rid of some stuff and bring in new stuff or, so that was a thing where I was always comfortable 
in a new situation where either you have to meet new people or eat new food or find out a new city and how you get around in that city. I, I wasn't frozen by those situations, rather viewed them as opportunities. Does it freak you out as it does me when, when you meet somebody who's had friends since kindergarten? Oh, yeah. And someone who's lived in the same place yeah. for 40, 50. Yeah, I, I, that's, yeah, it freaks me out. Exactly. That's a good, I'm like, how can you do that? That's my, <laughs> that's my feeling. Yeah. Um, I, and I guess the other thing is that you, you, you become exposed to different things. You know, wherever you go, is it's a different place with maybe different cultures or whatever. And, and, and so just having that exposure, I think, maybe gives you a different perspective on, on in the world. And that was it. Like, as I started taking this world of classical music more seriously, it, after school, university, it was kind of like the opportunity to go overseas and go to these European countries that I'd never really been to became more of a, a goal and a, like your world is, the world is only so big, but it's also so big. So it's like, why not see what's out there and just take in other places, cultures, and just learn from that, which makes you a more rounded individual. So did you do that? Did you go to Europe before you went for your Bachelor of Music? No, that was, I kind of stumbled into a Bachelor of Music. It was just, I really thought I wasn't cut out for post-secondary education. And I just kind of determined maybe that's just not for me. And was at Western University in London, Ontario, and barely got a degree because it was just figuring out who I was and what I liked and what I wanted to like. And that's where I found out I liked directing and I liked being connected to sort of the desires of the past, which were almost kind of music theater and theater, but also was introduced to opera, which is a, a wild <laughs> art form, which is you know, truly, I, I believe global in, in sort of its reach and how it like Don, you can see Don Giovanni in Australia, as well as um, Germany, as well as Toronto. And it's all kind of the same in theory. And so that's kind of universal. And that was really interesting and exciting as well. So when you went for the for music at Western, what was that? Was it were you hoping to teach? Were you hoping to play? What? <laughs> How, what were you doing in, in music at that point? Yeah, so I went to Western because I, I took another year to up my OACs. They still had grade 13 in Ontario. So I uh, wanted to get good grades to go into kinesiology. So that's originally why I went to Western. To um, I love sports and I loved how the body kind of works. And so, but naturally I took all my electives in music and just those people were cooler and I was just naturally better at that. So I kind of transitioned from kinesiology into music, um, which at the time and overall probably isn't the smartest move, but it was at the time the most fun and the one that I was most interested in. And is that music theory or were you, I know you played the tuba. This has nothing yeah. to, did it have something to do with the tuba or? It, I could get like free tuba lessons. So that was exciting. And I had traditionally done a lot of the tuba playing in the Salvation Army, whereas in the classical music world, how is the tuba valued? So it was like another world of knowledge and lessons and music. So that was exciting. But then it was also singing in a choir and meeting other singers who sang, but not in a church setting, which was kind of exciting too. So it was like, what are you interested in and what do you want to do? And I was living uh, not on my own, but not with my like immediate family. And that was kind of a new phase of learning and development as well. So you said at one point you were thinking that you wanted to maybe go on Broadway or act. Yeah. At that point where you're at Western, what are you thinking that you want to be? That was a good, yeah, I, I wasn't thinking that far, but like I acted in a Shakespeare play at university. I was in um, West Side Story in university, um, which was just kind of, I was starting to do what I wanted to do and naturally moving away from the church environment, which was a even sort of present while I was in university, but just sort of saying, here's this other world that I really want to know. So 
why not just do it? And that's where I got into directing a, like a short one act play. And so I was, I think telling myself, this is where I want to go. Let's explore more of that to see like what would happen if I committed myself to that. This is a silly question, but when you yeah. said you, you lived in a church environment, um, what, what was the most amazing thing when you came out of that environment or what was shocking to you? Was there anything that would just seem so different to you or was it not like that? I think part of it, it, when you're raised in a church environment, you're almost meant to, and I'm, I'm just generalizing, but believe that anyone not in that environment is like a wild, <laughs> like they're drinking every night and getting drunk and, and not to that extreme, but just, I want to say how normal people are outside of the church environment. And so that was kind of, um, and that church or one's faith wasn't the most important thing for a lot of people. And that was okay for them was kind of, I don't want to say eye opening, but I was really hardcore into what church could be and how we could shake that up. So it was like, there's a lot of parallels between opera and the church in terms of just these old art forms that have old people that think it should be done a certain way. So it was kind of like, again, cut and paste. I just cut and paste my passions from one to the, to the next. Interesting that you said <laughs> wanting, wanting to ch shake that up. So if you decided to follow your dream, sorry, if he had followed this path of going to the Salvation Army or whatever, you probably would have shaken that up too, right? Well, that's the thing. And like they had this big battle between like the way the music, the old way and the old people, how they like music versus the guitars and the electric guitars and the drums and people even in the church were having like the same service, but with different music for young people and old people and like, you find that in opera. It's like new music versus the traditional rap and in people are, this is this, or I don't like that. So it's kind of, yeah, it was very, very interesting and just, uh, yeah, just pushing the boundaries and breaking the rules. I was kind of doing that as well. What, where do you think that comes from? The, the need to push the boundaries? I think personally for me, I don't always like to be told how something is and you have to, and it has to be this and you have to fit within those realms because anything can be done any kind of way I, I truly believe so for there to be one absolute is is really one hard to grasp I, I had different odd jobs outside of all this and like one of them was working at Starbucks for I think one or two years and it was kind of I dreaded the schedule of, I have to show up at work at this time. Cause what if I don't want to, what's going to happen? But um, there was also freedom in a schedule in terms of just show up and then earn your money. But then within those hours, you can find creativity and flexibility in there as well. So you, you go to London, I guess, is that where you went to? Yeah. Um, and what did that give you? Because I get this feeling there was a life-changing moment when you were in in the UK. So that has, so yeah, so one was University of London, Ontario. And then I also did go to London, UK for another huge moment where I went on a youth pastor training program. And I just decided I don't want to do that anymore. And that's not a bad thing. Like it was a choice. And I went to see shows on the West End and I was like, I think it was Chicago. And I'm like, I can do this. I can work in this environment and I can figure out how this happens to move people. And so that was a huge kind of altering decision moment as well to kind of say to the church people, I don't want to do this anymore. This is what I'm passionate about. And for them to, at the time, they were like, well, I'm kind of disappointed in you. And that's that wasn't the right answer looking back that they should have said instead of just supporting. But that also is part of the lessons I had to learn as well. Can I ask how your parents thought that? Um, how your parents reacted yeah. to that? So them being pastors, they, uh, and again, they have four kids. They want all their kids to be a certain way 
you know, love people, blah, 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 be, be good people. And for a while there was this pressure to, and, you know, there's a great church around the corner or, and you can write to this person. And so I think that was a, a thing. And for a while, um, there was this thing about wanting or feeling like it was the black sheep of the family. But as long ultimately as I was happy, I think they were okay with that. And I think now looking back, I, I know they see that things are good and that was like a good decision. But um, yeah, I, I know probably deep down it does not bug them, but there's something there for sure. But I think they also support individuals making their own decisions. So you watch this play and you think, I can do that. I mean, obviously by that time you had some experience being an actor or doing being on stage, yeah. but that wasn't what it was about, right? You didn't want to be an actor. You wanted to be a director. Yeah. So, so tell me how that, like, how does that happen where you think, okay, I can do that? Yeah. It was a thing where, um, again, it's probably related to how I love doing too much work, but it was kind of, as an actor, you're responsible for your part, your lines, and you kind of go through and you see, okay, how many scenes are, am I in? Um, as a director, you kind of, you're, you're in every scene, you're responsible for the whole shape of the thing. But then when you get into a musical, the first big musical I directed too, it's kind of, but then you're involved in the music and the costumes and the set and each person that you interact with is responsible for a different part of the whole. And you get to be a part of all of that, this kind of overall shape of things. And that was way more exciting and interesting to sort of say, what do people experience when you come to see this show? And you're just interacting with more people, every cast member and every chorister and um, how is their experience and how to, what they bring to the show how does that influence and impact everyone as well? So I, I want to say in some degrees, I'm an introvert, but then you get to connect with so many people and that kind of are for a short amount of time, whether it's six weeks, two months, they're your friends, they're your colleagues, they're the people that you're connecting with every day. And so that was more interesting than just being responsible kind of for the one, one aspect. So, at no point did you miss the acting portion of it? Sometimes, yeah. Sometimes you do because as a director, you don't really get to express and have that moment of what if I forget my line? What am I going to do? Or I have 100 or 200 people focused on me and my attention. So that there's a thrill in that that I miss, but not enough to be like, I really got to go back on stage at some point. How did opera come into your life? Because going to see Chicago and thinking I want to direct musicals is one thing. But I presume, I mean, in, in my ignorant mind, I think of opera as something <laughs> else, something bigger. Yeah. And it is, it, it is something else. And I didn't know much about it. I sang my first kind of aria, um, when I was nearing the end of university, which was an undergrad. Um, and so it's something I didn't know much about, but when the, I was looking at a MFA, like a master's of fine arts programs, I was looking at theater, which would have involved more musicals, but just my background was in classical music. And so someone just said, you know, have you thought about opera? Come be a, a super in an opera, which was is like an extra, a background person who doesn't say or sing anything so I was uh so I said sure and I was in Carmen it was 2006 I believe um in a production where I was on stage so you kind of get I got a little bit more of that performance aspect but I got to hear and be around this huge monumental opera with these opera singers who have trained for decades to do what they do and that kind of just clicked in terms of like this I could catch on to and I understand and I had certain friends from choirs and uh, as a teenager who were like training to be opera singers so it was just it kind of made sense to some degree and so applied to the one university in Canada that took opera directing students 
um, which was at U of T and they only took one student and um, thankfully got into that. Wow. So, sorry, yeah. what does that mean? What, you, they only took one student. Are you, are you the basically the only person in the classroom? <laughs> sort of, yeah. And wow. so there, when you get in, you're there for two years. Um, you have primarily one teacher. His name was Michael Albano. He's still alive. He's still teaching there. Um, we'd have like one-on-one -on -one sessions every week. But then you're also in the big group classes with all the singers. But there'd be about 20 or 10 to 12 singers and then the one me so when they would do a, an opera i would be assisting michael um and just learning and working that way so it was a great way to learn the traditional aspects of opera staging lighting um design uh but being in a non-pressured way i could just kind of assist in in my little notebook sort of say Oh, this is what this is. I, I would do it differently here or preparing a score. It's kind of a thing where if you're working in an Italian opera, I'm not fluent in Italian. So I've got to put in the English translation of what it is in my book, just to understand that I've worked with some directors uh, as an assistant where they don't do that. They, they grab a CD book to kind of understand what they're singing in English, which is a little bit harder because singers know word for word or they should what they're singing. And so I feel like that's the same responsibility for a director. So all to say it gave me great experience and yeah, it was what I needed to learn more about what opera could be. So, I mean, right there is a bigger challenge. It's not like you're just dealing with stage lighting actors, but you're also dealing with different languages. Yeah. Right. I mean, and to me, when I when, if I'm intimidated by opera, that would be the first thing is that there's so many different languages involved, and and to actually understand that in a deep way, did that come easy to you? Um, I thankfully my parents put me in French immersion in school, which I did not like, but gave me one of those extra languages, and thankfully, Italian is somewhat connected to French, and so that was a lot easier to pick up on. So that what that's what I thought was very cool is the language aspect. And so to learn more about German um, to sort of, I was involved in like interning at the COC when they did War and Peace, which is that great sort of epic novel as an opera in, in Russian. And so to hear operas done in Russian or in Czech um, was just, that made it kind of more interesting because you have to learn if you want to be better at it, you have to learn more about it. Yeah. I, I don't know if you can answer this, but what is it about you with, with very limited experience in opera that you would have been the one chosen to be in that program at U of T? I think it's not, uh, I don't want to say there's, there weren't a ton of applicants, like, but there was that aspect of here's someone who is a little bit older, who is making a choice and is passionate about what he wants to do. So there was an audition. I had to stage a scene from The Marriage of Figaro and had to be interviewed. And so I think there, there was just someone who seemed somewhat a little bit intelligent, who was curious about this art form. And uh, just, I think ultimately, which is a big philosophy for me is I love working with people. And uh, I primarily like working with people who are kind and generous in nature. And so I think that's what I also um, personify. So someone who didn't have a lot of um, hassle. It was someone who was easy to get along with, which I think came across in my application as well. So once you get into this program, do you have any idea what that will lead to or what the bigger picture is once you leave? No, it was more just, which I think singers do as well, is I don't need to think about what I'm going to do for the next two years. It was like, this is what I'm going to do. And I didn't know what kind of career that would lead to. Uh, I still don't really know what career <laughs> this leads to. You just kind of go with the flow, so to speak. And that just led to opportunity. I kind of think back, I'm like, how did I not know what I was going to do? 
and like, where was my family? Like, where were my siblings when I was in my twenties? And I was just doing my thing and thankfully finding enough money here and there to keep going, so to speak. And that just led to writing grants and you get a grant and that means you're good for the next little while. So I was lucky that the arts at a very minimal level kept me going at a time where, yeah, yeah, it was just tricky to, I didn't have to take on too many of those Starbucks or other jobs to stay connected to the arts. And did you, did you have a sense of where you would want to wind up? I mean, I think of opera and automatically I think of Europe, but I don't know what the North American scene was or the Canadian scene was. Did that matter to you? Not really. And halfway, halfway through, like at the end of my two years at university, I met Miriam, my now wife, who was, uh, she was in the ensemble at the Canadian Opera Company. So she was an opera singer and she had desires of singing in Chicago and in England and all this stuff. And that sounded really exciting. So I think as that became a more serious, I'm an opera director, it was kind of like, okay, where do I, yeah, where do I aspire to go next? And let's, aim for the top and see where that goes. Yeah. So how long after you graduated did you establish Against the Grain Theatre? It's kind of like the year out after graduating. Um, the COC had a young artist program for stage directors. I applied two years in a row. I didn't get past the initial interview either year. So I'm like, well, I wrote and I kept them. I have them all in a file. I wrote like 30 letters to different companies across Canada, North America, Europe, just saying, can I come hang out at your company? Um, No one said yes. And so it was kind of like, well, I have to create my own opportunity because no one seems to have the time right now. So um, that's what led me to starting against the grain. That's what led me uh, someone took a chance in Norway. So I went to Norway where they had a brand new opera house, which was gorgeous. Um, they Is that the one right me. by the water? Is that, that's the one yeah, right by exactly. the water. Yeah, exactly. It kind of emerges out of the water. Yeah, yeah. And you can walk right up on the, the roof. So it was, uh, that was one of the great sort of experiences of like opera is not just a Canadian thing, but yeah, a global thing. And I can do succeed in Norway if I wanted to, just as I could in Canada, that was a, another eye opener. It's the same thing. It's, theater works the same way. It's just different language. Before that offer came, though, when you when you sent out those letters and had rejection or no responses yeah. to your request to to work with them, how how did you deal with that? Oh, it sucks. Rejection sucks, and it was. Not as bad as a singer, meaning I couldn't be a performer just because of how devastating that is. Like that is directly related to your person, like your voice is is you. But it was just, it was more of a, a like a problem in terms of, okay, well, if not at these places, where and how can I do what I want to do? Because I knew that I could do it. It's just who would give me that opportunity. And I didn't expect everyone to say yes. So it was kind of, I'll do what I can. So my wife sang and covered at the Glyndebourne Festival in the UK. So I just wrote to as many companies in the UK. And one finally just said, you know, we can't pay you much, but if you're going to be here, sure, be an assistant director. And that's kind of how that worked. And often it was having a director advocate for me and just say, I know this Canadian guy, he's great. Can you pay him the bare minimum just to happen? And so that's how a lot of things happen. And then in those environments, I could just kind of accept the limitations, but then just thrive as well, like do my thing. So part of doing your thing is the Against the Grain Theatre. When you first started it, other than maybe it being the vehicle to do what you wanted to do, what did you have... In mind, what did you hope to accomplish with Against the Grain? I just wanted to direct a show. That was the big thing Um, because no one was hiring me to direct. There were a lot of assisting opportunities, but that's not me making in my head the choices or deciding things. So I thought, well, now I can do it this way. Um, What I didn't know, no one told me or taught me was that if you want to direct a show and produce it, 
there's a lot of decisions that go into producing. And so all of a sudden, and I just didn't have anyone helping me then because I had no money to pay anyone. So it was learning about building a website and booking a venue and finding grant money and do, selling tickets and booking singers. And all of a sudden, all that goes into producing, I had to learn the basics in order to direct the show, which I wanted to do. So it was kind of a default that I ended up picking a lot up of these admin skills, which now are just like, there's, they were foundational for how I work today. How much of what you do for the, for against the grain would be directing? Like what percentage of time is directing and what is everything yeah. else? Now, like literally today, December 9th, 2022, it's uh, di actually directing 20% of of the work maybe even less of against the grain whereas in the earlier days it was 75 almost 100 percent. so it was it's changed drastically but that just kind of shows in some degree how far against the grain has come in terms of granting bodies and donors and corporate sponsors and private don donors and just keeping everyone going keeping the machine going and now working with other colleagues there's four employees at against the grain which is still kind of small, but considering we started from zero 12 years ago, um, yeah, that's a great sort of balance. And it's again, another 10, 15% at Edmonton Opera and sort of Banff is the same. So it's kind of, and I, I'm going to hold on to the, that small percentage because that's what actually gives me joy and <laughs> kind of wakes me up in the morning to do what I do and working on this film that we just did. Uh, could I have been involved more artistically? Probably, but it also took a lot just to keep it moving and going. So I know that I'm trading off some of that artistic creativity, but part of that is just to make these projects happen and keep moving forward. I, I presume at this point, because you're involved in so many different things, even if LA calls you and says, can you direct us? It's not like you can say, yeah, I want to be a director for six weeks and I don't have to worry about anything else. Because while you're doing that, you still have thing to worry about against the grain and God knows how many other projects you're involved in, right? Well, that's it. Like during Carmen and at the COC, when we were doing our <laughs> film as well, every lunch hour was booked with Zoom meetings. Everything was, every like evening was filled with catching up on emails. So it was kind of, because I live in Edmonton now, um, I didn't have that commitment to family. So it, sadly it freed up more time so i could kind of balance how i would tackle things so that's the that's the tricky balance now of how to keep those all going keep sane try to find time to eat food and and then what kind of food do you eat do you finally have that salad versus all the those other decisions so it's it's not necessarily a a healthy um way but i also you can kind of predict and know when those higher peak work times are going to happen okay so one of the goals was to expand the boundaries how does that happen how how do you get those ideas and like it, when you first started with against the grain did you have a clear idea clear vision of what expanding the boundaries meant or does that kind of evolve over time and and, and beyond that, how do you come up with these ideas? And that's a good question, too. You need space and time. So that's a harder thing to find now in terms of just moments to think and doodle and, and have that space. But um, a lot of those earlier decisions were financially motivated, meaning we didn't have money to do a lot. So what could we do with what we had? And so with young designers too at the time who are in similar positions it was kind of yeah how do we how do we focus on that in terms of what can we do with the little amount that we have and it may well let's do a bohem and a bar because we can't afford a theater and we could build a set but what if the actors are actually just like the people who are coming to see the show what does that do and it was like well that's kind of interesting i haven't seen or heard that well, then if that hasn't been done and what we know, then let's do that. I was kind of drawn to creating new experiences rather than trying to do what what we know, what we knew we couldn't do, if that makes sense. 
Okay, but now you're at a point where you, you are doing things like the, working with the COC and, and yeah. putting on massive productions. You're all, you're involved in that, the traditional operas. Um, and maybe it's not traditional in the way you present it, but so does that change things? That The fact that you have access to a, a bigger opera stage? That does, it could, because at first I wanted to say, okay, I can do this weird different thing because um, in some ways there's nothing to compare it to. But when you're directing at the COC, you let's try to be like what the COC is. Um, and that working at Minnesota, Vancouver, um, all these other companies, I would try to bring a little bit of what I do, but then try to do the big a certain way. Um, whereas eventually and over time, it's kind of like, you know, let's just do what my gut says and let's try to make this as, um, different as possible, uh, within the boundaries of what we can do. And so you try and you'd press and you'd push a little bit. Um, so I want to do more of that. And that's kind of, I feel what this next phase of me and my career is, is how do we shake up that big model a little bit more in terms of what opera is and what it can be. We did it with a little and that's kind of good, but is there a room in the bigger space? And it's harder because the bigger space is more expensive and it's harder to take risks because of that expense as well. The need to also go beyond the boundaries, is it just that, I mean, do you have this desire to get an audience that's different from your normal um, opera fan. And is that is that the ultimate goal, is to bring opera to people who might not have opera in their lives? That's one of, yeah, that's, I don't know if that's the ultimate, but that's definitely one of them to say, this, this music worked for me and I'm not a traditional opera fan, so it must have worked for some people who don't know about it. So how do we get through and crack through to them? Um, opera has been done a certain way and will always be done that way cert at certain times. And so it can be something else. So that's another purpose to say that it isn't just this one thing. Um, and it's to, again, probably what motivated me in the first place is to push against those rules and say, it doesn't just have to be this. And if it's new for us, it's new for the team that I'm working on, then that's kind of makes it exciting because you're, you're learning. And that's always something I think that makes life and art fun is that you're learning more and you're learning the good and the bad. And hopefully there's more good to take into the next experience as well. Now that you've done the opera pub in various locations, a number of different productions, is it what you th hoped it would achieve? Are you looking to expand it to a different level or what was the think, status of the yeah, opera pub? That I think is expanding more and sort of what I think, yeah, opera and bars, you know, it's contentious. It shouldn't be contentious. It is sort of overall for where does opera belong overall. But I think, yeah, the more places it can exist and sort of be is just good for, good for opera. It's good for, people who just want to ex experience things and to, to go to a restaurant, to go to a bar, to go around the block and to experience something is something that people will remember as opposed to, yeah, this impersonal cold experience of going to a big theater and not really connected to anyone. Um, like it would happen either way, whether I was there or not. Whereas I don't know. There's something riskier about sort of those smaller intimate experiences that that feeling. Yeah, I don't want to miss out because what what would happen if if I didn't go? OK, so the other thing that you did and I'm not familiar with how much Against the Grain did film work before the Messiah Complex. But during the pandemic, you decided to do this, put on this production. Can you yeah. talk a little bit about that? And I know that it was very well received. I'm not sure if it was what you had expected, um, but tell me about the the work in film that you decided to yeah. pursue. So I loved, loved and loved film. In undergrad, I had applied to some film schools, but for some reason didn't 
pursue it, which, you know, I don't know if that's something that I'm thankful for now, but it was, uh, it was always a curiosity and a, a joy. Um, but when the pandemic happened, we were ready to present Messiah. We have a staged version of it and choreographed, so done differently. But, you know, like everyone, we were just like, okay, so what can we do? We learned, we did a bit of putting cameras in people's living rooms and doing opera pubs that way, but that wasn't fun, really. It wasn't interesting. It happened. Um, so we learned quickly and we could, metrics would tell us that people were kind of tuning out after a minute. So we said, well, let's match the visuals to what our outside the box opera experiences are known for, which just meant better cameras, better sound equipment. Um, and that led to kind of this project of, you know, what if we do Messiah as a film and because of the pandemic, we couldn't really film indoors. So if we safely do it outdoors and then typically the Messiah is done with four singers who sing, I don't know, three or four numbers each. So we thought, well, it could be easier. Let's just get one singer to do one number because you can't really, it's not cost effective to do that in a live situation because you're paying each person the same live performance amount. Right. So, so then it just said, okay, well that could work. And then what if we did every province and territory across Canada, that would be a cool satisfaction of like, we ticked every box that way. And then we were going through this huge social critique on the world and in the classical music world. And so we just kind of said, well, what if we got diverse singers from each of these provinces and territories as a, as a way to do that. And all of a sudden it just kind of snowballed like this image of a snowball, just picking up and getting bigger. That's what kind of happened. And we had no connections. And so it was just cold emailing people, do you know, a film crew in Winnipeg or who could audio record and film something in Yukon and researching different types of singers. And that was almost the most enriching part to find diverse singers in all these places to sort of say who could sing what. So that led down this rich experience and partnering with the Toronto Symphony Orchestra, which couldn't have happened outside of the pandemic. So I kind of say a lot of great did come out of that pandemic for us. And we had no idea what it would be or how far it would reach, but um, what it ended up being was <laughs> far more than we ever could have imagined. And then how did that happen? I mean, obviously it was quality content, but beyond yeah. that, it got great reviews. And and it's, it, it obviously premiered to a lot of people, maybe, if I'm not mistaken, more people than you would have expected initially. Oh, yeah, then, then probably ever we will have as well. It was like this alchemy of like, people feeling sad because it was the holidays and they weren't able to be with family or share in their usual traditions. There were like no live messiahs happening with live audiences because of pandemic. So, and then they saw this beauty of scenery shot incredibly well. They heard the music that they knew, but then they also heard it new, new ways in new languages and, at the time, the focus on indigenous issues, which are still very much present, um, on Muslim issues, um, it was just this celebration of how different Canada is. And then it just like, just we got lucky. The CBC Night News picked it up at one point. Margaret Atwood became a fan and started sharing about it and she shared it on BBC News in the UK. And so all of a sudden, it became the Messiah of the season and gave people a lot of joy when I think they were, it was just the perfect timing. And because the lack of coverage, like the New York times wrote about it and it was just, I think people were like, how the hell are they doing it? And somehow it just, one thing just led to, to the next. And uh, we brought in, we made the film free for everyone to watch. And so that just led to, incredible amount of donations coming in. And I think people were just, it touched people in a way that we can't duplicate. It was a, it was like a unicorn. You just can't copy that either. So that was a unique experience and something probably I'll never 
live through again in terms of how raw and also how beautiful that was. Does that put an extra pressure on you? Or did you just go with the idea that it was a unique circumstances, everything came together at the right time, therefore it is what it is, and I'm not going to try to match that? Or I think we tried to match that. that. Yeah, to build on that, to, to say, hey, digital programming and videos can work. They can generate income. I think it was maybe a little naive and unicorn-like now. Um, it led to great opportunities where we were able to make more films and you know, I did a, a TV special for the, the National Arts Center that was aired on CBC because of it as well. So, and gained more experience and gave more opportunities. So that was amazing that way. But I think what we're experiencing now is people are swamping back to the live experience. And so the pendulum has swung completely the other way. Uh, I don't want to say there's a revolt against the digital, but it's also... Yeah, I think it'll balance out over the next little bit as well as um, more live comes back, which is great. But then hopefully the digital doesn't all just disappear as well. How far out, how many different things are you currently working on? And how far out are these projects? How, when will they be actually be available to see? Yeah, that's a good question too. So thankfully and we're looking years in advance. Um, not everything happens the way you want it to. So that's what I love about these projects too, is they morph and at the last minute you can add something and change things. But um, yeah, especially with Against the Grain in Edmonton, we're looking a couple, like at least a year, if not two, three years in advance to sort of say, let's put this there. I, because of that, I have to kind of align my schedules a bit more to okay, if I'm here then, I can't be there then, so we have to move that. So it's very selfish at the time because a lot of it revolves around physically and sort of virtually. When can I be there? Because I we can't be at two places at the same time yet. Right. Um, so that's kind of a good thing, but it's also, yeah, I'm able to balance more of that schedule to hopefully not be as busy as I was or as I am <laughs> currently. So we'll see how that kind of shakes out as well. How many productions in a year for Against the Grain? We had been doing like three to four live. Uh, we started doing like two to three films, which is a little bit crazy as well in terms of wanting to do them better and have a better process and how they're made and released. Um, and even that, like you release a film we're thinking of Toronto, but again, a film can be shared all over the world. So the distribution of that sh can and should be much bigger. So it's kind of like the more you learn, the more daunting it feels because, <laughs> because of how much more you could and should be doing. So that's what was beautiful about the Messiah Complex as well as we had no idea what we were doing. And so we just thought, oh, this is how it works. So that's what it is now, I think. Um, ATG, we're looking probably at like three experiences now and a blend of live versus recorded, filmed. Um, and we'll just see how that shakes out. We're also dependent on grants and they want you to do the live shows. And it's there's not a lot of specific avenues now for a filmed experience that way, if that makes sense. So it's kind of trying to tailor what we can do and where we can find the most money um, as we all kind of emerge out of this weird time that we've been through. So 12 years into Against the Grain, is this what you would have imagined you would be, where you would be? <laughs> no, and that's kind of impulsively, we just go with the wind, if it looks, if you go back through time. So it'd be good to find some consistency. We have a new strategic plan though, like which is a very fancy, <laughs> business terms. So we're kind of getting more formalized, which I think is good for overall stability. I'd love it to live on after I've moved on. Um, I want that just so that that's a cool legacy. Um, but we'll see it. I kind of also love that it's being stubborn and not deciding what it wants to be right now. It's kind of growing up through, I'm seeing it with my kids. It's like, I thought you were this and now you're becoming this. And so <laughs> I don't want to put too many rules on that as well, because that's kind of the nature of what it is. It kind of goes against the rules as well. So my final question, at this 
stage in your life, do you have goals looking forward? Whether it be with your personal work or with with the theater company? Goal, yes, yes. Personally, I have goals for each of them and for myself. Um, do I know how it'll play out? No. <laughs> Is there confidence in jobs? Yes, but I also know that it can change. I think the more you add, the, the older you get, the, the more you feel you can't take as big a risk because part of that is like you take on things like you buy a house and it's kind of like, okay, I need to pay for this house. So how are we going to pay? I need consistent income. So, but you also have to trust how you got here, which was by being risky and taking chances. Um, so it's more strategic that way. And so I, the goals may not be specific, but the goal of always trusting your gut or taking a chance are things that I hope I stay true to. Um, and I know that if I stick that way, that will stand out from the rest, so to speak. So it's exciting. It's exciting to be able to love what you do when you work, when you love your work, that's, that's a joy too. Not everyone loves their work. And so, um, I feel very grateful to be living in Canada as remote and it's not completely remote for all your Edmonton listeners. <laughs> I live in Edmonton, yet I'm still connected to, to to Toronto, to other parts of Canada, to the U.S. So at the moment, that's a huge blessing and just, yeah, grateful for able to have a career in the arts and live in Canada. That's, that's pretty unique, I think. Well said. Um, it was a pleasure working with you this summer, and and I I'm, I'm really appreciate you taking this time to talk to me because it's as I said many times it's a world I I don't know much about and and when we work together I asked you a lot of stupid questions and you're very patient <laughs> no. with me <laughs> but but I do appreciate you taking this time thank you so much for doing this thank you it's a it's a joy I look forward to part two whenever whenever we get to do sort of the next next round podcast so yeah it's I love talking about this and really appreciate you asking great questions no thank you. Mm-hmm.